Should we start it off? Let's do it. All right, Trey Malone, how's it going, man? Uh, you know, it's just another one of those weeks. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how to begin, how to start talking about what's happened since Friday. So um, let's try to focus a little bit on one of the <laughs> things that's happening. Um, we, uh, we've been, I think, talking about <clears throat> China for at least five years now. I feel like I hear about China every single day. Uh, that's really ramped up, especially in the last week out of the White House. Um, one thing that really, I think, stuck out for everybody um, was A, the civility of the vice presidential debates, but, but B, there was finally some conversation about what international trade really was going to look like, uh, maybe in a future administration or a continuation of the current administration. Um, I, I like this photo grab that I stole from the Financial Times. They're running a series that they're calling the New Cold War. Um, and I, I, I think it's interesting just because, you know, even though we want to talk about this juxtaposition of, of like, well, we just started talking about international trade with China, with Trump. This has been a conversation for a very, very long time. And this trade relationship has gotten stronger and stronger. Um, the hard part, though, I think for folks is that none of us really know that much about China, at least in, in kind of the rural economy, I would say. I mean, I, I, uh, I've never been to China. Schaefer, you ever been to China? Yes. Really? I've been to, I'm sorry to let you down, man. Yeah, I've been to Nanjing, to China. And... <laughs> no, but so, so Trey, you, you say that the trade relationship uh, is stronger than ever before. And I wonder uh, if At maybe. At least the size of the relationship is bigger than ever before, right? Like I, so, but, but honestly, both of us, well, you're, you know more about trade than I do. I, I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, so it, we reached out to somebody that actually has spent a fair amount of time in China and researching China. Um, we're really excited to have Ortega join us. This is uh, so Dr. David Ortega, an associate professor in our department. Um, if you Google him, don't look at the image searches because uh, it <laughs> please won't be Google him. him. I think you mean. Uh, <laughs> 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 there will be a lot of shirtless models and then a guy in a bow tie at some point so <laughs> he's the one with the bow tie disappointingly <laughs> um, but so so David Ortega has been uh so he was tenured actually super early in the department uh last year he was named as the Southern Ag Econ Association's Emerging Scholar uh just this summer he was named as the uh John K. Hootskick 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 couldn't, couldn't, uh, can't be that I'm not sure what it is, but it's definitely not whatever you just said. Hudzik. Hudzik. There we go. Hudzik. Um, emerging leader in advancing international studies and programs. Um, so, so Ortega has been studying this stuff for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, regardless of what I talk about, David probably knows more about it. Uh, this is a screen grab of, uh, of David on the NBC Nightly News there at the beginning of all of the mayhem. Um, so he, I mean, it's, it's been NBC nightly news. What other places have you been popping up in? Uh, it, it was, it got <laughs> pretty hectic there for, uh, for a few weeks. There was, you know, CNN, a lot of the major news, um, channels, um, you know, sort of talking about, uh, more domestic issues, but, but also, um, you know, how some of the China stuff was influencing, um, what we're seeing here in the U S as well. So, so Ortega, I guess since you're the guy that's talked to all of the media uh, on this question, do you agree with Trey's point here that our trade relationship with China is stronger than ever? Well, I, so I don't, I don't know if I would say that it's, it's stronger, right? I think it's, um, it's become very important um, in the last, uh, you know, few years, at least since, you know, this Trump administration has put a spotlight uh, on China, what they're doing, and in our trade relationship with them. Um, but, you know, I think if you turn on the news, sort of like Trey was saying, you know, it's, it's hard to go a couple of minutes without hearing China, whether it's, it's the trade war, whether it's uh, COVID, um, African swine fever. Um, and so there's just a lot that's happening um, with China and our relationship with China um, that I think is important for us to, to really understand um, but also, I, you know, and I think what, the thing that sort of bothers me as, as someone that studies uh, China is, is there's a lot of misconceptions um, about China and, and, you know, what, what's happening there. Um, and so I think um, it'd be good to sort of talk through some of the things that um, I've experienced and, and come across in my research to shed a little bit of light on, okay, so what, what really is happening in the other side of the world and how is it affecting us here 
um, in the U.S. And, and, you know, we can sort of hone in on, on ag issues um, both there and then also how they're affecting farmers and consumers here in the States. And so Ortega, you're, you're, I'm really looking forward to all these slides. You've got, you've done like a really cool deep dive into what, what food markets in China look like. Uh, I guess just right before we jump in there, uh, I'm curious as to your perception of uh, when we talk about trade, yeah, China's a big country with a big population. Um, and so we would expect we'd be exporting a lot of stuff there. Um, I, I think there is this concern, at least in my mind, that maybe China's different. Maybe these market signals don't work uh, when we're talking about China because of things like state uh, trading enterprises, um, communism. So, so before I guess we dive into the nitty gritty of what the food markets look like there, can you talk maybe about that regulatory and the state actors uh, and that how, how yeah, that so, influences this, this? Right, no, so absolutely, right? So we have, you know, you couldn't have two vastly different countries from, from a lot of different angles. Um, you know, political systems, um, you know, market size, we're talking a country that's, you know, almost 1.4 billion people, right? Um, you know, four times the, the US population. Um, the way that they do, um, you know, diplomacy and policy is drastically different, right? Um, you know, their political system, um, you know, communist revolution took place in China a few decades ago, right? Totally different from what we have in the States um, and sort of the input and, and um, you know, the fundamental values of, of what we have in our democracy here are just vastly different. Um, and just looking at the market size, right? So 1.4, 1.3, 1.4 billion people, anything that happens in China is gonna affect the US. Um, whether it be market opportunities, whether it be um, when we're looking at imports of agricultural products into the US from China, right? What happens there? Um, domestic affairs in China um, with, you know, issues in the rural economy, food safety, that's going to affect our, the safety of our imports and our food that's coming from there. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it's um, also important to look at, you know, you're talking about some of these uh, major players, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of parastatals in, in China, sort of government arms that are responsible for um, issues of, of trade, um, Kafka. Um, one of the cereal company of, of China, sort of a parastatal there, they're the ones that deal with import and export of, of grains, right, that are affecting um, global markets, that affects um, trade relationships, and, and they're the ones that set, set that in motion, um, which is, you know, vastly different from what we do here um, in the U.S. and um, sort of the free market aspect of, of our trade relationships. So I guess I just think about like the the phase one trade deal mm -hmm. where China says we're going to buy X number of or X value of, of U.S. agricultural products. Uh, and if it was any other country than China, that would be an almost nonsensical statement, right? right. Because they say, yeah, maybe we'll change the regulatory environment. Right. Uh, but but firms and people decide what to buy. Right. In Here's China, it, it's not a crazy thing, right? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a central government. They're making decisions on behalf of the country with, um, you know, and there's the, um, you know, in Beijing, you have sort of the, the you know, the, the party that's running the, the government, but there is no input. You know, there are no senators that um, reach out to constituents and, and there's, you know, that type of representation like we have here in the U.S. Um, it's, you know, the party decides, um, you know, what's in the best interest of the country. And then, you know, they put that forward in, um, some of these types of uh, trade deals and trade negotiations. But so, okay, so so we have, you say it's a big country, people are like, anything China does is going to affect the United States. But what if we play this game where like all of a sudden we just uncouple supply chains from China to the United States? A, is that even possible? And B, what would that look like? No, well, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you go, Ortega. Yeah, um, well, so, you know, I think it's, the world is so interconnected, right? That it's gonna be very difficult to, to uncouple ourselves as a country from what's happening in China. Um, you have supply chains, you know, sort of working um, in tandem. And, you know, it, I think it's gonna be very difficult to, um, you know, sort of become independent from, from what's happening in the country. And I don't know if that's sort of what you were alluding to there, Trey. Well, I mean, that's just the conversation you hear is people are like, well, forget China. Let's let's try to do something without China. I mean, there, there's a that was the argument for stepping out of TPP, right? 
was that, that you know, and, and I don't yeah so to me you know that might those might be great sort of political talking points but the reality is going to be drastically different yeah I just want to so that's, that's the point of the, of the we that I was making there where in the U.S. we have a free market system where firms and, and individuals decide who they want to play with right so we can be in the trans-pacific partnership or not uh and that kind of sets the regulatory framework, but it's individual traders, individual um, growers that decide what things they're going to grow, where they're going to send what. In China, it's inherently different. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Right. So, you know, and that, this is why we see, um, you know, government investments to try to recoup the, the hog sector after the aftermath of the African swine fever. Um, and there's sort of, there's a lot more, you um, it's, it's a lot, it can be a lot more directed, right? And, and it's, uh, and you can think of it as, okay, maybe it's more efficient, you know, democracy can be very inefficient at times, um, but you know, it, it's sort of what Alex was alluding to. It's, it's a very different system. Um, and that really affects, you know, what they're able to do and to the extent that the government can step in and, and take care of um, what they want to accomplish. Let's so, do it then, man. Let's dive into the, yeah. the system. Okay. Sorry, Trey, did you have something smart that you needed to get off well, your chest? Well, I had a thought, but we can keep going. So, okay. So, um, yeah, so this, you know, this, I, to me, this figure, I know it means probably nothing right now to anybody. Absolutely <laughs> um, not. Fact. But to me really highlights the difference between um, the agricultural economy and what's happening in China and how different it is from the U.S., right? So this year, um, it's a very famous line, um, the Tenchong He He line. Um, we can just call it the He line, and that's what some people call it. Um, it roughly divides the country into two equal halves. The, you know, the, the yellow on the western part is um, slightly bigger than um, the eastern portion, but just think of it as 50 50. Geographically. Uh, gra geographically, yes. Yeah, okay. um, in terms of land area and. and yeah. uh, 94% of the population in China lives in that red area. Um, and that is also where a lot of the agricultural production takes place. Um, so if you think about, you know, this graph versus, you know, what we have in the U.S., right? So our population centers are on the east and the west coast. You know, you have some, the Great Lakes, uh, Chicago, some major metro areas, but, you um, Population and agricultural production in the U.S. are in opposite ends um, sure. geographically, right? You have a lot of, you know, the Midwest, um, where you don't tend to have as large population centers as you do in, in, in the coasts. But in China, you have agricultural production and the major population um, density and population centers practically coexisting and living side by side. Um, and so there is, you know, approximately six, it's increasing a little bit. Um, just 6% of the population living on the Western part of China. Um, David, and, am, I, am I right that there's some, some ethnic distinctions between these two regions too, or is that not right? So no, no, not necessarily with regards to this map, uh, okay. but there, you know, there's, uh, over 50 ethnic minorities in China, um, you know, Xinjiang, um, and then sort of the Uyghur minority would be in the Northwestern part of the country, um, okay. sort of on that Northwest part of, of that uh, yellow part of, of the graph. Um, Tibet um, also takes place there, um, sort of in the southern part of, of the yellow portion, uh, southwest. Um, but, you know, there's ethnic minorities in southern China and, and you know, in many more numbers than, um, so it's not, I wouldn't necessarily uh, think of this as, um, you know, Got it. ethnic minorities in one section versus the other. Um, but what's, you know, and so why is agricultural production taking place um, also in, in the eastern part of the country? And that's because the Western part of the country is not suitable for agricultural production, right? That's the Tibetan Plateau, the Qinghai Plateau. Um, beautiful country, um, but you can't grow anything in it. You know, there might be uh, yak herders, uh, you know, and in the Tibetan Plateau, um, but that's not, it's not really suitable for, for ag production. And, um, you know, you tend to have pork farmers, um, crop farmers, um, you know, very close to highly uh, or densely populated areas. Um, so you start to run into um, issues, you know, ind industrial effluents getting in the water supply that's used to irrigate crops. Um, you tend to have, you know, farmers, you know, disposing of 
um, you know, agricultural waste that gets into the water supply and, and starts to create, you know, pollution problems. Um, soil pollution in China is a huge problem. Um, cadmium contamination, right? Heavy metal contamination from, from having, um, you know, industries operating near um, agricultural um, operations, um, you know, make, make that, that, you know, have really made that a, a big problem for, for um, uh, not only consumers in China, but the products that we get from China to, to come to the, U, you know, that get imported into the U.S., and how about the, the structure of the agricultural industry? So I have in my mind, and maybe I'm completely lo- wrong, a whole bunch of little bitty plots, whereas in the, in the U.S. Uh, our, our farm sizes are approximately ginormous. So, you know, I think that, um, yes, so there is some um, truth to that, but it varies by industry. Um, and, and, and it's also, it's evolved very rapidly. Um, so, you know, I focus most of my work and research in China on the hog industry. Um, and if you were to go back, you know, 20, even not that long ago, 15, 20 years, a lot of the hog production in China was done at the backyard level. Mm-hmm. Um, so the farmer with, you know, three or four um, hogs, um, you know, behind in, in, in a, you know, right behind his house, that has come, you know, we, I remember um, writing about, you know, 60 to 70% of hog production took place in backyard style um, operations. Well, that's drastically decreased, right? I've been to um, you know, big pork um, hog rearing facilities outside of these major cities. And these are state of the art, um, you know, facilities, um, huge farms, um, hog operations. Um, you know, we saw Smithfield, right? There was a big takeover back in 2013 with uh, Shanghui and the White House group. Um, that is a huge conglomerate, it's a big agribusiness firm, right? Um, but when you go um, to southern China and you're looking at rice production there, yeah, you have the, you know, some farmers with a small plot. Um, and, and a lot of this is also tied to the land tenure system in China, um, which is drastically different from what we have here in the U.S. Um, so, um, you know, in China, farmers don't own the land. Um, they own rights to the land. Um, and those rights, um, you know, and, and that, that's the case for all type of um, land use, whether it be residential, industrial, agricultural. Um, and the leases from the government are um, vary in, 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 in the number of years. And I think for agriculture, you know, don't quote me on this, but I think it's a 30 year lease. Um, and the government can always buy it back for, um, you know, things that they, they think are in the public interest. Um, but that also poses um, constraints on farmers. Um, so for example, um, you know, there are transfer rights that have emerged in the last uh, few years where a farmer can transfer his rights to another farmer and they can sort of build their operation. Um, but when it comes to getting, say, an agricultural loan or a loan for a bank, you can't really use those, you can't use your land as collateral. Um, or at least that's, you know, I think there, there's, this is always an evolving process, this, this uh, land tenure, land right issue. Um, and so, you know, there was a, the, there was a communist um, takeover in China and, um, it, you know, they sort of appropriated um, the land and then they sort of divided it up into the you know, household responsibility system. Um, and so, um, but as we're seeing, there's a lot of changes happening in the country. Um, and, you know, we're starting to see some um, investment in large agricultural operations um, that have, you know, emerged over the last 10, 15 years. Even among grains, you're saying, even, even for those rice patties. Um, for some, yes, okay. um, you know, especially the, the, the um, you know, the companies that go and do business in China and try to export um, some of those crops or, or grow them in a, at a larger scale. Um, you know, one thing that I've um, come to know about China, right, there, there is no, um, you know, average Chinese consumer, average Chinese farmer, that just doesn't exist, right? There are, um, sort of subsistence farmers that still live in, in the countryside, the rural areas. And then you have, um, you know, the more um, business minded agribusinesses, right? That are, that are working with farmers to um, produce at a, at, a, at a larger scale. Um, and the same thing happens, you know, when we talk about the consumption or the consumer end, um, there's rural um, consumers versus sort of the urban consumers, right? And, and their preferences are drastically different. Their income levels are drastically different. Um, and I think a lot of us, when we see the media and we, we're looking at images of what's happening in China, you know, we're, we're seeing tier one cities, um, Beijing, Shanghai, um, Guangzhou, and, and, you know, and that's, yes, it's, it's a significant size of the 
Chinese market, um, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, so, so, so I guess when I think about the implications for the U.S. in terms of what you describe, and, and maybe it's fine if I'm if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. But you're saying we have in in, in pork, for example, these major operations which are really efficient modern producers uh, in in some of these grains those tend to be dominated by the more subsistence people. So in terms of looking at trade relationships, I would expect um, our competitive advantage to be on that feed supply, right? Which is, which is traditionally, I think what we've, what we've seen, we've seen soybeans uh, as the major thing we're sending to China. Absolutely. At, the same, at the same time now, when you look at the numbers uh, just for 2020, for example, and, and I look at where stuff's going gangbusters, it is pork that's going like crazy. Is that is that the result of the swine flu or swine fever, sorry, uh, or the trade war uh, commitments? What's going on there? So, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Hmm. You know, so I wouldn't necessarily classify, um, you know, and, and I don't work so much on, on the crop side of things in China, but, you know, it's not that... Um, the reason that we don't see China producing um, a lot of crops is because of subsistence farming. It's just, there isn't room to produce. There's no arable land. Well, they- yeah, so I guess that's the same story, right? It, it may uh, not be so, the, the little patties, but but the right. comparative advantage for the US is in that input side. Correct. Right, and so, and, and we've On seen- the arable land side thing, I just want to point something out really quick because I think it's super fascinating. There are that many people and it's a, basically the same landmass size, right? As the United States. Roughly, yeah. I mean, roughly speaking, more uh, or less. Yeah, more or less. Which is just nutty to me to think like like people think that the United States is running out of space, but like China is, <laughs> like 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 the place where nobody lives is also the place that you can't grow any food. Exactly right, and that's I think that's a fundamental constraint that sort of characterizes the agricultural economy in China, um, and you know, and, and also just to put it into perspective, right? So. Um, numbers of farmers in China roughly equal to the US, the entire US population, right? Just, you know, imagine the entire US population involved in agriculture, right? That's what we have in China in terms of the numbers. Um, but, you know, um, going back to sort of what Alex was asking, um, you know, so yeah, so, you know, we're supplying China, you know, they're a huge importer of, of soybeans. Um, a lot of that is driven by um, a rise in, in, in meat consumption in China. Meat consumption has just skyrocketed over the last couple of decades. Um, and, you know, they need the soybeans to feed their hogs, you know, oil production. And, and so, and, and, and that's where, you know, the U.S. can step in and supply, um, you know, Brazil is a major, you know, bigger than the U.S. in terms of supplier um, in the world market. And, you know, and the U.S. also imports uh, soybeans from Brazil. Um, we are, you know, the U.S. is also um, emerging as a supplier exporter of, of pork to China. Um, and I, that is in part due to, um, you know, that the um, pork production has been devastated, right? Completely devastated um, by African swine fever. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of us have heard about it. It's, it's a deadly disease for hogs. There's no real cure um, and it's just decimated the pork production. So if you look, so you have this graph up on your screen. Um, so when I was doing my, my um, graduate work at Purdue, I was um, working on pork production and there was um, the porcine respiratory uh, syndrome that was affecting pigs, so the blue ear pig disease. Mm-hmm. And if you look around 2007, there's a little dip there. Um, and we thought that was huge, right? In terms of, okay, that's <laughs> that big dent in Chinese pork production. Look at what's happening now. Um, so we have, you know, 40 estimates of 40 to 50 percent of hogs in China um, being either culled or, or just killed by this disease. And this is, you know, it's it's not quite the entire the size of the entire U.S. Um, hog industry, but pretty close because um, China is the largest producer and, and consumer of pork in the world. So these are significant numbers and a significant dent on on Chinese pork production. Um, and, you know, this is where the U.S. can come in and fill some of the void. Um, but what I, and this is why you've seen, you know, exports um, to, to China of pork increasing the last couple of years, even admit, uh, you know, in the middle of the COVID meat shortages, right, that, that we heard about. 
Well, hold on though, because the world can come in and fill that void. So this is where I'm curious about the about the U.S. Uh, numbers jumping, right? Because it the the world doesn't consist of China and the U.S. Right? Uh, the world consists of all of those other places, Brazil, right. like you mentioned, who's a huge hog producer. Uh, but when we look at this, uh, the U.S. has very large tariffs instituted as a result of the trade war that we're talking about. And yet we see this massive increase in numbers of pork uh, exports to China. Is that, are we seeing the same responses in Brazil as well? And so this is just on top of the tariff war or is this something else? But So keep in mind, so the, the, the tariffs were the, the retaliatory, retaliatory tariffs that the Chinese put on U.S. pork that's right imported into China, right? Um, and so, but they're also facing right a very a domestic crisis in pork production, and so they've they, they've there there have been these um, I don't know if they're side deals. You know, I'm not into in you know in in the um, what's happening with the actual trade negotiations, but you know they've committed to buy um, this amount of pork. Um, as a one-time purchase um, from the U.S. to help fill the void um, that you know that they're seeing from from um, you know African swine fever. Do you uh, happen to know, just off the top of your head, what the numbers look like from Brazil, for example, or from other regions besides the U.S. in terms of China? exports to China? The bump in in, in exports as a result I, of the I don't ASF. Have numbers. I mean, I can play. I have you know, I don't have them off the top of my head. Sure. Um, but, you know, but they, they're, they are reaching, you know, they're importing from Brazil, from the EU. It's not just the U.S. Right. Um, but what's, I think, key about the U.S.'s um, ability to, um, to meet that demand is that, so the Chinese have, you know, they, they invested, if you want to think of it that way, right? When, when they, um, they purchased Smithfield back in 2013, um, there's already, you know, it's, it's, they're still operating in the US, it's owned by a Chinese firm. Um, and so there's a channel there in place. Um, there's other wonky things happening with the trade, uh, the trade of pork with between the US and China. A lot of it is centered around this feed additive ractopamine, um, which is, you know, at least 10, 10, 20 years ago was predominantly found in, in hog production. And it's just, it, it's a, um, a feed additive that makes the the animals produce um they're more efficient at producing leaner leaner meat um the chinese don't like it um and they are banning um not only the us but in canada any countries that, that produce um the products you know they're not wanting um they're testing the shipments at the board uh, when they come in and if they're testing positive for this they're sending them back well so you know smithfield they have dedicated facilities that are ractopamine free that are destined for the export market to china Got it. Uh, that makes some sense to me. If there's uh, some some technical standards there, yeah. Yep. So, so there's there's you know there's that at play as well, um, but you know unfortunately for um, our hog producers, for American hog producers, right? We saw um, African swine fever um, increase Chinese import of demand for for pork, um, but then you had the tariffs in place, right? So the, it it was sort of a missed opportunity um, where the U.S. Um, hog industry couldn't really sell their products to China when they were in need of this because of what was happening with the tariffs. Um, same thing happened in beef. Um, so there was a ban on beef for about 14 years. It was um, lifted um, a few years ago. And this is going back to um, Mad Cow back in the early 2000s. Um, and it was, you know, beef demand in China is growing extremely rapidly. Um, it's still low compared to what, you know, aggregate pork demand is in China. Um, but it's growing very fast. And, and then you had the Chinese putting um, tariffs on American beef going into China, right? So it's also, it, it, it's, um, you know, it's really unfortunate because we were positioned um, very well to, to sort of meet that demand and, you know. Except we, for the brick wall. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can you, so can I'm, I'm, yeah, I want to ask a it. really dumb question. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to give a talk to aquaculture producers in the Great Lakes region and my first talk I ever gave to aquaculture, I put up USDA data on aquaculture in the United States. And I basically got laughed out of the room because they didn't trust the USDA data. Um, and that's in my backyard. So uh -huh. how much do I trust USDA foreign agricultural service data of on the ground China pork production, uh, especially as it relates to long-term forecasts? 
So, okay, with the, actually, that's not, that's a great question. Um, so I think the USDA does a good job of trying to verify numbers as much as it's possible in terms of what's happening in China. Um, you know, I trust the USDA way more than the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture and the statistics that they put out. Um, but again, you know, there's a lot that's happening in China that we just don't know about. Um, and so you have to sort of, you know, take um, those numbers a little bit with a grain of salt in terms of what's really happening. Um, you know, when it comes to, to African swine fever, um, these are USDA forecasts based on, you know, what we know about the situation in China. Of course, the government may not be uh, forthcoming about the exact numbers of, of animals that are being affected by this disease. Um, but this is really, you know, what we got. <laughs> that, was, that was a deeper critique, I think, that just revealing that Trey is a survey guy uh, and I'm a trust in secondary data guy. Just a fundamental well, disagreement, I think, about what things we trust and what things we right. don't. That's probably true. I, I mean, I think, David, I, I think about, like, like you said, in 2007 in your graduate work, um, you know, there was that dip in production of, of uh, Chinese pork. How much time did you spend in China trying to collect primary data to understand what was going on on the ground? Well, so, I mean, that's, that's I, you know, the, the bulk of my work has been um, looking at and doing consumer surveys in China. Um, you know, so I've spent, um, you know, it's been over 10 years working in China, not, you know, 10, you know, full time, but you know, I spend months at a, uh, a year in China doing surveys. You know, when I was a student, I was doing them with other graduate students there that were helping me. Um, now I have, um, you know, graduate students working um, on China topics going on and collecting data. Um, and so that, you know, that, that's why it's important to, you know, when we're looking, especially at marketing in terms of what's happening with consumers, um, you don't get that very fine level data where you can segregate, okay, what are urban consumers doing that's different from, you know, even yeah. urban consumers, tier one, tier two cities are drastically different in their ability and, and willingness to pay for things. Um, and that's why it's important to, to be on the ground collecting this type of data. Um, Dude, I, I want to go to the consumer side so bad, but I just have one more question uh, on the producer side, which is I'm hoping uh, because you've got so much experience with China, you can a little bit look into your crystal ball and tell me, we know ASF is still a problem. And yet we know that for the U.S., we've still got this brick wall coming into China. So do we see those uh production stocks being built back up in China? Do we see the U.S. somehow responding uh, through these sustained increased uh, exports? Do we see Brazil saying, we get it, all we need to do is eliminate ractopamine, and then we get access to this huge market? So all of the above, right? Um, so what, what, <laughs> That's not a fair answer. <laughs> all of the above, right? It's, um, but you know, what I think is important to note here is, you know, the, the recovery is, is already underway in China, the pork sector. Um, the government is investing and there's not just government investments, but, um, you know, private investments in hog production. Um, I mean, it's, it's really mind blowing the amount of money that's going into the sector to, to recoup and, and sort of recover from, um, from what um, they went through in the last couple of years. Um, with the US, you know, I think, um, when we look at U.S. pork in China, and this is, I've done a lot of work on demand and preference, and I'm not trying to go to the, the, the consumer side, um, but, you know, consumers view U.S. pork as being very high quality and being very safe, and food safety is one of the, the most important um, concern in the mind of Chinese consumers when it comes to food. Um, and so, you know, we have, yeah, we have this brick wall, these tariffs, but, um, you know, if, in, 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 I, I can't imagine they're going to be sustained for, for a very long time. Um, you know, once those stairs start to come down and we have access to um, their market, I think that the U.S., in, at least in pork, which is what I focused on, is well positioned um, for the Chinese market. And then also is, um, and it's, a, you know, China, when it comes to demand for pork, is a critical market for the U.S. hog industry um, in terms of keeping, you know, the profitability of the U.S. Um, hog sector um, up. You don't happen to know what's going on with ASF right now, do you? In China? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, yeah, not, I, I know it's in Germany too, and it's popping up in all these places, but, but what's the current situation? So, I mean, I've heard, um, you know, there's been some reports of um, vaccines being in, in, in the works for this. 
Um, I've seen proof of concept for um, bringing in biotechnology to, um, to make, you know, animals resistant to this. Um, and, you know, the, the Chinese government is taking this very seriously from just even a, a food security um, uh, perspective. Um, but, um, you know, it's, I think, you know, and I don't want it, to, it's hard, you know, I don't want to come in here and then predict something and then, you know, <laughs> the bottom falls out tomorrow. But um, I think we've seen the worst of it. Um, it's, you know, that's my feeling in my sense. Um, but, you know, but it's really hard to, to know. And, and, you know, I think the amount of investment that's going into recouping and recovering the sector is um, an indicator um, of that. But, but even before that African swine flu or African swine fever, yeah. um, the, uh, uh, um, the, the role of China in U.S. trade policy has been like so important, uh, particularly in, in the way that we deal with, I think, uh, uh, like interspecies contamination, right? I, you, you, uh, you actually spoke to Congress a couple of years ago, uh, and I, I wanted to highlight the food fraud task force idea there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so this was the testimony that, um, you know, so I was invited to provide congressional testimony um, in China. I wasn't able to go in person because my daughter was born um, that same week. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I, I wrote up a report, um, you know, it's a nine page report um, where I sort of go through what's, you know, the, some of the critical aspects of the U.S.-China relationship and, and what's in, importantly, what's happening in China that affects our trade with them. And, and a lot of this has to do with food safety. Um, so there was, you know, at the time that I was doing my work in China for, for my uh, dissertation, food safety scandals like crazy. We had milk, we had pork. Um, and, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of other things that are happening there. So for example, antibiotic use in, in aquaculture is, it's a big deal. Um, we import a significant amount of aquaculture products from China. Um, and you know, there's health um, consequences to some of these practices. Um, and the USDA ha actually has a team of, um, you know, like boots on the ground that are looking at, you know, sort of um, what's happening in the domestic system. I mean, how could, does that affect the safety of our imports from China? Um, but food fraud in China, you know, it's been around since, gosh, I don't know, centuries, right? But we're seeing, um, you know, there's been a rise of um, fraudulent activity um, in, in recent decades in China that I think sort of put the safety of the food supply that we get from China at risk. Why is that? So yeah, is it, that was my perception too, that there's been this rise. Is well, so, that we're, we're identifying it more or, or is it a true rise? Well, so, you know, we, we do it. Um, so when you look at imports that come into the U.S., they do get in, they get inspected at the port of entry and, you know, they do re uh, drug residue, antibiotic testing and all these types of things. And, you know, we, um, and th th these aren't ra really randomized testing of products. Um, you know, there's information of what's happening in China that may say, hey, you know, there might be something going on in, say, the aquaculture sector. We, want, we may want to look more at those shipments that come in. So, you know, just something to, to keep in mind. Um, but, you know, you know what's, what is the, um, the root cause of this? And this is why it's important to know what's happening in China, right? So we have, you know, over, you know, 300 million farmers in China. Um, fragmented, although there's some consolidation taking place, but largely fragmented compared to the U.S. Traceability systems, right, aren't as efficient or, you know, and parts are not really, ex you know, they don't really exist in, in, in parts of the country because of how difficult it is to keep track of uh, various farmers um, and, and, and their, their crops and livestock. Um, and so there, there really isn't um, a modernized food safety um, system in place in China, like what we have here in the U.S. in terms of monitoring, um, in terms of, you know, being able to trace food and, and, and um, those types of activities. Um, and so, um, you know, that leaves room for um, bad agents in the food supply. Um, you know, people that you, you know, melamine, for example, we saw that in the milk industry, right? Um, it's a plasticizer. Um, so what were they doing in the, in the dairy industry? They had, you know, collected dairy from um, hundreds of farmers in a collective and they were adding water, diluting the milk, but then adding melamine so that it would show up as a false protein in the uh, quality tests. You'd think some of the punishments that that, that feller was dealt out might be enough to be preventative of the future, but we don't really see that happening. Yeah, you would, you would think, right? But, but it's still, you know, it still happens. And I think, you know, it's getting better. Um, 
That was, he was killed, by the way, right? He was sentenced oh, yeah, with okay, the death I mean, penalty. Well, people, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're, their penalties, yeah, it's like life. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one thing to keep in mind, right, and I'm not trying to paint China as the villain here, um, but we went through some of those same things as we were developing um, as a country, right? Look at um, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, right? Like what was happening in the meat factories in Chicago, right, almost a century ago. Um, you know, and, and that's, it's not just, it's just part of the development process. There is a book that I would very much recommend reading about that topic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, there's actually also a PBS special that just came out. It's called The Poison Squad. Okay. Uh, but it's it's exactly about what you're talking about. That like like we talk about like uh, you know food fraud and dangers and additives and everything else in China. But if you step uh, 50, 60 years back into the United States' history, I mean the development of the FDA was all primarily focused on trying to reduce issues with food additives and things like uh, dairy milk for kids, yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, even whiskey. Uh, so, so whiskey was a big issue for a long time. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that they, like pe people talk about it, like, like this is all new, but like we, we've been there before. It's just, right, it was a long that, time ago. You know, so we did, you know, we did our, we went through the development process, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not a development economist, but I am skeptical of the kind of development curve type stories. But I, I take your point here that the kind of institutional capacity is is at a different level than it is. And, and, and stylizing a bit, right? Um, yeah. For generalizing. But, you know, what, what took the U.S., you know, a century or more to go through, China's doing in a few decades, um, and that's, you know, and, and the, you know, I, I think for me, what, what intrigues me and, and what I love about my work is that I'm watching it happen, mm. right? I, I've seen, you know, it's, I kind of wish I, I, I were around, you know, maybe 40 years ago um, as a researcher, because there was, that's when it really, you know, picked up. Um, but we're just happening, we're, we're, it's happening now, we're seeing it. China's a huge country, um, so it's a big deal. And, and you know, we have uh, news media now, you know, that wasn't the case, you know, centuries ago here in the States. Um, and so we're, we're able to, to see and, and hear about these things. But, you know, this wasn't just common to, to the U.S. You know, if you go back to, to Europe, right, Victorian times, you know, and, and there's a great paper by one of um, my mentors that works at USDA, Fred Gale, where he talks about, you know, Victorian England went through issues of food safety and food fraud, um, you know, many, but many. Let's, 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 let's take it a step toward where we currently are. This, mm -hmm. I think this figure or this photo is pretty good because like like yeah we we can compare to what like how people ate maybe you know 100 years ago in the united states but like there's this weird mixture right of of like like the the wet markets which we'll talk mm -hmm. about here in a minute but also just like the standard fast food service that you and i could get down the street but it's not really the same thing well but right. that's the, yeah sorry I'll, I'll let david answer but to me there's a, we're talking about a couple different things right say i want to buy your development curve argument that's part of this sucker yeah. this is different consumer preferences i think is the story that right, but it, it's driven by rising incomes right it's driven by the shift from rural to urban areas right and, and the rise of the middle and upper class in china um and you know and what what this highlights right so this is kfc um and kfc is um it's almost, it's hard to describe how popular KFC is in China. Hmm. Um, it is in just about um, every city. I think there's something like five or 5,000 locations um, throughout the country when, you know, when they were picking up, you know, they were building a KFC like every couple of days in China. Wow. Um, and what's, what I, you know, and, and I, I use this as an example in, in the class, the undergraduate classes that I teach because it highlights, you know, the importance of understanding the Chinese consumer. It, it's key to the success of KFC. Um, so you have Burger King in China, you have McDonald's, right? I, you know, Burger King, there's only a, a few hundred stores. Um, McDonald's, uh, you know, I think around two to 3,000 stores. Um, McDonald's in China is selling the American experience, right? You can go get, um, you know, the same number two in, in the US is probably the same one in, in, in China. But KFC has really, catered their menu and their offering to the Chinese consumer. Um, so here we have on the left, you know, so that's sort of, um, it's like street uh, night uh, market food that the KFC sells. Um, you know, I've worked in Inner Mongolia, sort of the nor Northern province in China. And, you know, you have very traditional food at the KFC um, uh, menu there. And then you go to Southern China, rice becomes very uh, prominent and, and they've really tailored 
they're offering to the Chinese uh, consumer. Um, and, you know, and, 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 you know, people go to, to KFC to hang out. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of what Starbucks used to be, you know, 15 years ago. Um, when I was in high school, everybody just went to Starbucks to hang out and, you know, you had meetings at Starbucks and, um, you know, that's what sort of KFC is now for, for a lot of um, Chinese consumers. Again, we're talking about upper middle class. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're neglecting a significant portion of, of the country in, in this type of discussion. Um, but I just, I find it fascinating um, that, you know, when, when you look at a company sort of really understanding those consumer preferences, right, it led to an explosive growth um, in, in sort of their business. And uh, Yeah, so, but I mean, that's a story that people have been saying forever since we started talking about like, an international development or, or international sales in general. Like, I remember when I was in college, everybody was talking about Walmart moving to um, Germany mm -hmm. and how um, they would put the greeters at the front of the Walmart and uh, the greeters would wave at people and smile in Germany. And the Germans absolutely hated every moment of somebody smiling at them and waving at them. Um, and so I, and so it didn't work. Um, and, and so like when I think about moving into China, uh, understanding consumer preferences being different is, I mean, that's, it's like, a, okay, yeah, we all know that that should happen. Uh, but what, what is different? What, what do Chinese consumers actually want that is different than what we currently provide in the United States? So, that's a hard great, question. Great question. Dave right. Ortega's whole career, right? Like, so, like how many papers uh, do you have on I'll that Explain topic? your career, David. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. So, you know, we talk about, you know, just understanding, um, you know, just culture in general, right? So the food culture in China, people like variety. You go to a dinner in China, you know, uh, Alex, you've been there. It's, you have these banquets, right? It's like, tens and 20, you know, dishes that are just coming out. And um, so, you know, when you look at KFC, for example, right, their menu, and I'm, I'm really thinking about some of these case studies that I've used, I think it's something over 50 menu items in a KFC in China compared to like 20, 30 in the US. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're really catering to, to um, you know, sort of that the inherent differences in, in consumer preferences and how they view food. Um, you know, it's, um, when you look at, and, and to me, you know, so KFC, I. I wasn't, I didn't grow up a fan of KFC. Um, I mean, I went to it every once in a while, but it wasn't like the McDonald's or the Burger King outings that we had as a kid um, growing up. Um, but in China, um, you know, they, they've really, it's not just, oh, you know, we have the one or, or two um, local uh, food items on the menu. It's like the entire menu is drastically different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, um, it's a complete overhaul and a complete sort of alignment with with preferences and what's happening um, there. I guess I'm thinking some of the, the types of foods that they eat uh, mm -hmm. are, are things that we kind of consider byproducts in the US. So is that, is, is that true? In Maybe way, that's 10 years old. In a way, right? But, but for them, yeah, but for the, you know, they don't, from, from the Chinese perspective, that's just what they know, right? They don't know that it's, you know, that they, people don't eat those types of, of you know, uh, protein cuts yeah. or whatever what have you in the US. Um, and, you know, and, and going back a little bit to, to the pork discussion, right? So what I think really made sense for um, the U.S. hog industry, right, to, to pursue China. And th at the time that I was doing a lot of my graduate work, what I was finding in these consumer surveys is that preferences for pork in China were complementary um, to, to preferences for U.S. consumers in terms of pork. Um, so in the U.S., we tend to, you know, because why? Other white yeah. meat, right? So lean pork loin. Um, in China, they wanted fat and they wanted sort of the, the offal or, you know, sort of the, the things that we don't eat, uh, you know, the liver, the tail, uh, feet. Um, and, you know, those were the, the most sought after parts of the animal in China. And those are things that we didn't really use um, here in the U.S. And so it made sense, right? If we're going to throw this away or, or, you know, put it into low, low, low use, um, or low value use, right? Send it to China where, you know, they're willing to pay significant amounts of money for these types of cuts. Um, now that's slowly changing, right? Because um, you, um, there's health concerns that have increased with, with rising incomes and, and people are now shifting to, to leaner cuts of, um, of, of meat in China. And this has all happened in the last, you know, since I started working there, you know, 12 years ago. Um, but um, it's, um, yeah, I think it's okay. important to make that distinction and, and, and highlight that. My, my next question, my follow-up question is about how, like, in the United States, we've talked until 
I could almost just choke on my own words about how um, the uh, food away from home has dropped by 30 to 50% uh, year over or month over month. Uh, you know, people aren't eating at restaurants or eating at grocery stores. Um, and, and I've been saying forever that like, well, that's not really a fair just like split anyways, because uh, rotisserie chickens at Walmart are going to count as grocery, but like, really, you're just going to eat the rotisserie chicken in your car and in, in the parking lot if you're like me. Oh, so, gross. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> uh, well, too bad. All uh, right. So, uh, so in China, ha what percentage of meals are like food away from home restaurant sales versus um, like actually preparing the meals at home? And if it's preparing the meals at home, where are they, where are they buying their food? Is it like a stand? Is it like a mire, or what's what's going on? So again, um, and are you talking sort of pandemic times or pre-pandemic or just well, what the norm was, and then what the pandemic did to the norm? Okay. So here's the thing, right? With China, and this goes back, you know, it's I don't have a clear sort of authoritative picture on what's happening because the data isn't there. Um, but you know, so to, just to sort of paint a rough picture. Um, Again, it really depends of what type of consumer you're talking about. Um, you know, so it's it, in the U.S. Yeah, there's sort of upper middle and lower class, and in China, in in, in China, it's the same way, but the, the extremes are farther apart. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, when you're talking about characterizing, uh, say, the urban consumer, you're, it's th that doesn't apply to to the rural consumer or rural families. Um, but so, food away from home is for urban consumers is I would say. Um, more prevalent than, than here in the U.S., um, but not in the sense of oh we're going to a restaurant right we're going to we're going out to dinner no you just you, you eat food you street food there's vendors there are um, uh, you know shops that are small shops and that's where you go and have have lunch um, or dinner right and there's these elaborate dinners and that's you know a bit of a different story mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic you know and again I don't have a clear picture on this but. Where, what I've been reading and what I've um, been able to, to sort of figure out is um, they were very strict with their, um, you know, preventative, you know, shutting down the economy um, or not, not necessarily the economy, but just quarantining people. Yeah, movement. Um, and, and it, it was, it, and it was sort of mandated, right? Like this yeah. is just not happening. Um, and so from that perspective, right, there was a significant shift um, and, you know, people were sort of, um, ration in terms of when they can go to the grocery store and, and those types of things. Um, so it's, the, it's a lot, the, that contrast, which I think it, it was starker in China than in the U S but again, right. The population there is more used to having these types of higher level, um, actions being imposed in, in a time of crisis than, than we are here in, in, in the U S. Well, let's let's pivot into the pandemic then, because I mean, when we think about food in the pandemic, at least the first thing that people started talking about in like March was this idea of wet markets, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I mean, if it, that was like all of March in my mind it was people talking about wet markets, and I remember you kind of going off on Twitter a couple times about how what people are calling wet markets in the United States are really not what wet markets are. Right. So, so can you, can you the, jump into that? Yeah. And that's been one of the biggest frustrations that I've, um, you know, that I've had in, in, you know, hearing this discussion. Okay. So you have COVID, um, and, you know, it came from this Wuhan wet market, and, um, and then you had, you know, U S senators calling for the banning of wet markets in China. And it's like, Whoa, 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 I already take a step back. Right. Because what they're referring to, right. And, is you know there are there are wildlife markets in China, right? That's a thing there, and some of them are illegal markets. Um, there are wet markets, um, which, and you know, there is some overlap between the two, but it's very very minor, right? You may have a wet market that there might be another um, a facility near it or adjacent to it that is that is selling illegal wildlife or or live animal products, and um, there are some significant issues with those, right? But by and large, wet markets are where the majority of consumers in China go and get things like pork, things like poultry. Um, yeah. I guess the difference is so hard for me, David, that I don't even know what the distinction is. So assuming that this thing came from bats, uh, is that something that you're talking about would be in a wildlife market or is that in this thing you're no, describing so that, that as a wet be, market that would be in the wildlife market i mean okay. I've, I've been and i've spent um 
you know, weeks, if you combine the time of, you know, it, just observing wet markets in China and doing research and, you know, interviewing consumers there with, with my team of um, enumerators, I've never seen a bat <laughs> in, in a wet market in China. Um, you know, and, and I, I've been to wildlife markets, um, but they're, they're not when I was at a wet market. Um, and so just to give people an idea of a wet market, you know, people call them in the U.S. farmers markets. Well, I think it's a, I think that's definitely a better characterization, but the majority of U.S. consumers don't shop at a farmers market, right? Yeah. That's sort of the distinct. That's where I okay. That's where I don't like that that characterization. So here, you know, this is from a, a survey of consumers that I, um, this is in Beijing, I believe. Um, so urban consumers, um, and you know, nearly fifty percent of them, and this is back in two thousand and fifteen. Um, procured pork, this is about pork, from a wet market. And this is in Beijing, a major urban tier one city, right? If you go to tier two, tier three cities, these numbers are gonna be much higher for wet markets. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, it's very dangerous when, you know, we start and, and see, okay, this is what's happening in China with the virus and then start calling for banning of things um, without really understanding, you know, how crucial they are to, to um, the local uh, food economy, because that's, you know, wet markets are where the majority of consumers get, um, you know, procure their, their products. So this photo on the left there of you? Yeah, you yeah. Could, so that's, is that a wet market? That, that, that would classify as a wet market. Um, and so this would you be- you can tell me you were at a hipster spot in, in Brooklyn and I would believe- No, no, no. no. I'm fairly sure he is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, so this this is a pork seller um, at a wet market um, outside of Shanghai, um, and you know, and wet markets can take different um, you know forms. Some of them are open air. This is we just happened to be it was covered, um, but you know, like this pork seller, there's multiple other pork sellers, um, you know, in, in this in this market, and it's a wet market because you know there's I think people have sort of um, different justifications for the name, but you know they literally. Um, you know, it's not dried food, right? It's, it's proteins. And at the end of the day, they go in with the host and just host the whole place down, right? To clean it um, before the next day's, next day's operations. Hmm. Um, but, um, you know, and, and, but I do want to point out that there are some uh, safety uh, issues with wet markets in China, and they do need to be regulated, um, you know, for, for safety standards and quality standards. But, um, you know, that's, completely different than calling for a ban on these things. And, you know, and I don't think the, the evidence is really out that, um, you know, where, where this virus really started and, you know, and the connection to, you know, and for me, the connection to a wet market is just simply um, mischaracterization of what's happening. Can we, can we, since we're, we're desperately running out of time and I'm a trade guy, yeah. uh, it would just be interesting if, if we could go to the, um, so we've talked about our, maybe what Biden's perceptions of the future trade policy would be, uh, potentially what Trump's uh, ongoing perceptions of the trade policy or the trade war would be. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the Chinese perception uh, of the U.S. and the trade yeah. war. So, um, so we did, um, so we were in the middle of, of the trade um, war and tensions with, with, um, with China. Um, you know, we, I put out a survey with, um, you know, Titus and the department, we surveyed Chinese consumers. Um, and, and, you know, there's been a lot of, um, like I think Pew and a couple other, you know, polling organizations in the U.S. have put out, you know, what the U.S. consumers think of, of China and, and the trade relations. But, and so I'm like, well, you know, we don't really have a, uh, a good idea of what Chinese consumers think of, of what's happening. And so we, we surveyed about a thousand Chinese consumers on what they think was happening um, with the U.S. And, you know, and the numbers were very similar to, to what we have here in the U.S. Um, you know, they think that trade really is better um, for, for their economy, but um, only 62% of them find trade with the U.S. to be favorable. Right. And, and then the U.S., I think that number is about 64 percent that find trade with China to be favorable um, or here it is. Sixty eight percent of America's current trade policy, um, you know, they find it to be unfair. Um, and in the U.S. is about 62 um, percent. And so what I think it's key to keep in mind is, you know, this trade war, I don't think is, is benefiting anybody. Um, you know, when we, from basic economics, right, the deadweight loss is there. Um, we're seeing higher prices. They're seeing higher prices. Farmers are affected here. Consumers are affected there. Um, and so- yeah, Well, so let's be clear of, of which actors, which agents you're talking about there. 
uh, for whom this isn't benefiting. By that, you mean consumers and producers of, of the products that are being traded, right? Correct. Abs yes. That leaves uh, out an important stakeholder there, which is the government, but, but I'll let you keep going. I know, so, but, um, no, but, also, but there's a difference between consumers and voters. Right. I, I, I always wonder if, if like you ask somebody as a voter, uh, you know, like, are, are you willing to pay or are you willing to force China to do something, mm -hmm. you know? Sorry, keep talking. Yeah, no, no, but, but, you know, so this is just sort of the general, um, you know, urban Chinese, um, you know, individual, um, you know, and, and what I think it's, you know, so yes, we're seeing the effects of, of the trade uh, tensions and trade war, or we saw them at the height in the U.S. with farmers losing access to, to China, to the Chinese market, you know, soybean farmers were tremendous, tremendously hurt by this. Um, but on the other side, right, there are consumers, right, and there are farmers that are also being impacted. Um, and they're being impacted by actions of governments, right, that, um, you know, and so it's just sort of, you know, what this was meant to do is just to put um, some light on, you know, the same issues that we're facing, or that we're reacting to for in terms of, of the trade war and the effects are happening in China. Um, and um, you know, I think it's also just important to keep in mind that, yeah, there are farmers in China that are also um, being affected by these um, actions that, you know, and it's, it's hurting them as much as it's hurting some of our farmers from, from different, you know, different industries. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> um, different industries, of course. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it's, and, and I don't think the American consumer or the American public really, you know, gets a sense of, okay, what is happening in China? How is it affecting them? Um, it's network. super interesting, man. I'm not sure. I know we got to We got to end. I'm not sure that these are um, good news numbers, right? No, they're, right. They're not. Um, they're, they're really not. And, you know, I hope that, um, you know, we start to see a different, um, you know, a different take on what it means to have a trade relationship with China moving forward, right? Whether, whether we have a change or not in administration, um, I think we're going to have to start thinking very carefully about, um, you know, how we approach China as a trade partner, because it's going to be affecting um, significant stakeholders on both sides of the ocean when it comes to this. For the rest of our lives. For the rest of our lives. <laughs> if, if we can't, we can't uncouple, even right. if we want to. Yeah. Interesting. It's, yeah. David, thanks so much, man. That was really interesting. Oh, this was fun. Um, thanks yeah. for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's uh, yeah, it was good. Good talking to you guys. Awesome. And we're going to be hearing about China moving forward, so this is not, this is not going to go away. <laughs> for some we'll have to have you back. Thanks, man. Yep, you bet. All right, cool. thanks, guys. See ya. All right, thanks, everybody.